et cetera, et cetera, and we looked at a, sort of a number of things, and we ended up with looking at uh, that we need to look at things in context and all those things. And during the week, I came across an article, and I said, oh, that's very interesting. It directly relates to what we were talking about. And I'm going to pop, it, pop up a quote from it here in just a minute. And uh, you want to distribute those? There's some handouts coming there. Uh, we talked about how when we, when we interpret the Bible, uh, the Bible only has one real actual interpretation. It has many applications, but there's only one true interpretation. And uh, how we interpret the Bible is influenced by our background, by our biases, uh, a whole lot of things, the same as that's the way we interpret everything in life. But that doesn't make it right because we interpret it that way. But uh, we are influenced by our, by our thinking. So I came across this article, and somebody was challenging somebody else's method of interpreting the scriptures. And in that article, it gave a statement from this interpreter as to how he interpreted scripture. And most of what he said was, it, it was pretty much right, but he was twisting it in how he used it. So I thought, well, that, that fits right in with our lesson. So it's not part of our lesson today, but it's part of the ending of our lesson last week. And I thought, well, that, that's a good illustration. So here's the, and, and the other thing that, that you might note is that the, uh, the quote from this is from a magazine called Christianity Today. That wasn't where I got the quote, but this article was in Christianity Today. And that should tell you something right there that there's probably something wrong with it. Uh, there's not too many articles you read in Christianity today, today that are probably theologically, eschatologically, and so on correct. But anyway, uh, so I give credit in there for where it came from, but I'm not promoting that magazine. So I said a wrong, a wrong contemporary view on interpretation. That's what this person said. And if you read it, if you, you just read it real quick, it's good. But then you have to realize that he's, he's trying to make a point. We would first need to understand that all theological interpretation is contextual, that we bring specific priorities to the text based on our own histories and social locations. That's, that's a true statement, isn't it? When you read the Bible, you have some prejudices, or you may, may or may not understand things be, depending on how much you've studied the Bible. So you may read something or other and say, well, that's kind of weird. Well, when you study the context, you know it's not weird or whatever. Uh, so that's sort of correct. In this sense, he says, there is no such thing as pure biblical interpretation. And he's right in that sense. But there is pure biblical interpretation. We don't always get it, but there is. There's only one true interpretation. So there, but, but he says, in this sense. And then he says, all our interpretation is shaped by our histories. This isn't to say that there are no timeless truths or universal principles, but it is to say that even the questions we ask are going to vary across people groups and across time periods. Okay, overall this, this statement is pretty much okay. I'm not going to try to tear it apart. But here's where this guy's coming from. He illustrated this by talking about, and I'm not, we won't take time to go there, but you remember when Jesus went into the synagogue in, in Nazareth, he opened the scriptures and he read... And he, and he stopped in the middle of a verse from Isaiah. And he says, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. This person says that what Jesus was teaching was basically, I'm going to put a term on it, he didn't use this term, but basically liberation theology. That Jesus came to relieve the oppressed and set the captives free. And he does say he came to set the captives free. But he's talking, in a, he's talking spiritually. He's not talking about it's our job to go and, and uh, anyway, do all these social things. What will happen, though, when we do preach the gospel and the gospel takes hold is that the social things that need to be looked after will get looked after. Who has done the most in history to relieve social issues? It's been the Christian church. 
not other religions. It's been mostly the Christian church. You can go to countries that have very big populations of various uh, religions, and they're not concerned very much about the poor and downtrodden. But when the Christian missionaries go there, they bring the gospel, and what happens when people get saved? They get concerned about the poor and downtrodden. But that's not the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is that man is lost and man needs to be saved, and Jesus Christ came and died on the cross uh, to save mankind. And that's our message. And these other things are peripheral, but they do happen. A good example of that is back, I had a conversation with somebody just yesterday, early yesterday, uh, about, about this very thing. And if you go back and somebody was emoting that our country is lost and uh, there's, you know, nobody's going to do anything about it and uh, it can't be redeemed and so on, and I don't know what God's plan is for, for the future of Canada and the United States, but I did point out to this person that back in the 1700s, England and France were probably far more wicked than our country is today, believe it or not. I mean, if you, if you go back and read the history, Eng England was a very bad place in the 1700s. And God raised up some people, two brothers. Anybody know who those two brothers were? John and Charles Wesley and their friend, who was a staunch Calvinist. They were Arminians. Their friend who was a staunch Calvinist, and who was he? George Whitfield. And what happened in England? Tens, probably hundreds of thousands of people got saved. And England was saved from what happened in France, because France went secular. France denied the God that would save them. They went secular. They had a revolution. They just cut everybody's heads off, and, and so on. But England got, England got turned around, and for 100, 150 years, England was a relatively, relatively, on the world scale, godly place. I'm not saying it was a Christian nation, but it was a relatively godly place on the world scale. Uh, it's not anymore, because people have lost that. So the gospel has an effect on people, and the gospel never teaches that it's our job to go rescue the downtrodden as far as the gospel is concerned, but it's our job as Christians after we get saved to help the downtrodden, yes, but that's not what the gospel's about. That's not the gospel. So this person was using this uh, fact that we are colored by our, our history and how we, that's how we interpret the Bible and therefore it's okay to twist what Jesus said and make it fit into the context of the present day. That's what, he's, that's what he's really saying here when the interpretation is contextual. He's not saying it's contextual in the context of the scripture. He's saying it's contextual in the sense of what's happening today. So we should interpret it in what's relative to what's happening today. Well, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says one thing, and it means one thing. It may have other applications, it may be many different applications, but there's only one actual interpretation of any passage in the scripture, one that's correct. Uh, most, of a <coughs> most of which I hope we get correct, but you know, we could actually be wrong on something. We could be wrong. I remember Pastor Doug Fraser, he told me one time, he says, I'm in fear and trembling every time I get up to preach because I have to be right. He says, I know I'm not always going to be right, but he said, I have to be right because I'm, what I say, people are going to take as face value, and I have to be right. He says, I just, he said, I fear being wrong. Well, sometimes we get things wrong, and sometimes we have to say, look, you know, uh, sometimes we even say things that are wrong, and that's not what we intended to say. I did that last week. I, I gave the wrong name for a, for a place here in town. I was going on with another thing, and I left one one thing out and I said it was this name and it was that, it was, it's a different name but anyway that's, that wasn't a doctrinal thing, that was a that was a brain block somebody reminded me afterwards and I said yeah absolutely you're, I, I know that, you're right and so on so interpretation we have to be careful in our interpretation but it is true that our interpretation is going to be affected by our biases by our thinking, by our by our history. As Baptists, we look at the scripture, hopefully, as Baptists. 
And I believe that the Baptist uh, tradition, Baptist position, Baptist theology, whatever you want to call it, is as close to an accurate position as we're going to get on the scriptures as you're going to find. But it doesn't mean that other people are just totally wrong and they're a bunch of heathen either. Uh, you know, we don't have a corner on the truth. I believe we're the closest, or I'd probably be somewhere else. I, I would hope that if I thought somebody else was more scriptural than, than we are, I would go there. And I would hope you would too. But uh, anyway, uh, I just thought this was interesting that I came across this this week. This person's taking this context thing and they're taking it way beyond what anybody ever taught and saying, well, if the context is relates to our present situation, that's called situation ethics. That's another term for that. You know, if, if we have this situation, it's okay to do this, but in this situation, it would be okay to do that, and they're completely opposite. And uh, that's an, another lesson for another time. So anyway, that's not part of our lesson for today, but I wanted to throw it in because it just fit in so well. So we're talk going to talk about bibliology today, and I think you all got a handout there on bibliology. Bibli bibliology is a study of the Bible. And of course, that's a good place to start if we're going to study Bible doctrines because we should know what it is that we're studying, what, what, this, what this thing is that we're studying, this Bible. What, it, what is it? Where did it come from? How did we get it? Uh, what are the terms that relate to it and so on? And uh, there, I don't suspect that I'm going to say anything very probably new to most of you or or very new, very new to you anyway, and I hope I won't say anything that's not true. But there are two words that we need, there are actually four words that we're going to look at, but we won't get to them all today. Uh, we probably just get to the first one. In bibliology, we have two major words, and then some other words. We have revelation and inspiration. Revelation and inspiration. And then we have didn't show up on this slide. I didn't build the slide. I'm not sure what happened to it, but preservation kind of got lost on the slide. Revelation and inspiration and preservation. So our activity is going to be look at preparation, revelation, inspiration, and preservation. So what did God, how, how did we get this Bible? We're going to look up verses later, but I'll just uh, mention a couple right now. What did, uh, what did the epistle say? That How did we get our Bible? Holy, holy men of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Okay? So how did those people come to do that? Well, God prepared them. Some of them he pre prepared with a great education, and some he prepared with no education. Some, some had, uh, you know, uh, who was it? Uh, was it Amos said he was, uh, he was, was it Amos the herdsman, the son of Tekoa? I think that was Amos, wasn't it? That right, William? And somebody said he wasn't, he wasn't a prophet, nor the son of a prophet, but God called him to prophesy anyway. So God gave some people great preparation. The Apostle Paul, he had a, one of the greatest educations of his day. He was educated at the feet of Gamaliel. He had like a PH, what we would call like a PhD or whatever today, maybe a double, a double PhD, I don't know. But he was very, very well educated. Uh, Luke was a physician. He would have been well educated. Then we have Peter, like, people like Peter. The, the, they looked on Peter and John and James and they said they perceived that they were what? Unlearned and ignorant men. Now that didn't mean that they'd never, they didn't know how to read and write. Some people say, well, Peter, didn't, Peter couldn't have written this because he didn't know how to read and write. Well, that's not what that means. It means that they just weren't learned like Peter and Luke and so on. Didn't mean they'd never gone to school. And they were ignorant in the sense that they weren't part of the sophisticated group. You know, they're not, they're not our group. So they're just a bunch of ignoramuses. Do we get people talking like that today? If you don't agree with me, you're an ignoramus. Right? And I'm not going to get into the politics, but I could give you a couple of quotes that fit on that too. But anyway, we won't. So God did prepare people to write the scriptures, and he prepared different people in different ways at different times. What about Moses? What did it say about Moses and his learning? 
He was learned in all the knowledge of Egypt. Were they smart people? Did they know a lot of things? They sure did. They knew stuff that we don't know how to do today. Uh, there, there's stuff that they, they've built and so on, and people are still trying to figure out how they did it. And uh, Solomon was a pretty wise guy. I remember uh, a good friend of mine that uh, worked at the community college. He was a metallurgist and so on. And I, do, I can't verify this. I've never gone and investigated. But he told, he told me and several other people, he said, when, Colum, uh, when, Colum, when Solomon built those columns, you know, for the temple, but, uh, what, what, uh, Boaz and what were they called? Brain's gone dead here. The two columns, they had names. Uh, they were big columns, like this big and way tall, cast in bronze. And uh, John said, we don't know how he did that. They were cast in sand. They, they found the places where he would have cast them in the sand. But they don't know how he did it. They say, we can't do that today. A, a, a column that big and done with the technology that we know that they had, we don't know how he did it. So, you know, there were some smart people back there and God prepared them. Did Solomon write some of the scriptures? Yeah, what did he write? Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Okay, did he write some scriptures? What about David? We don't know that David had a great education, but he was the king. He was a shepherd boy. He probably had some education, but he probably didn't have a, you know, same as Paul or anybody. So what we're, that's what we're talking about, preparation. God prepared different people in different ways to produce this book. Some were very educated, some weren't very educated at all. But God prepared them. And then, we go to the next thing. Let's uh, talk about that. Revelation. God revealed to them what he wanted written. God revealed to different people what he wanted written. We have 66 books written over about 1400 years by about uh, what, 40 authors. And they weren't all in communication with one another. They, they, they didn't know one another. So, Revelation is the communication from the God that discloses his person and purposes which would be otherwise unknowable. Some total of the ways God makes himself known. That's Revelation. And there's different kinds of Revelation. We're going to look at those in a minute. But God reveals himself to us. Can somebody tell me one way God reveals himself to us? What's the major way that everybody has that God's revealed himself to them? Just look outside. Every, everybody can look outside and see, see nature, right? Not everybody has the scripture. Not everybody that has it has read it. But everybody can look outside and see there had to be somebody that did this. And the, the Bible says that the person that says there's no God that, that made it is a fool. He may be very educated, he may be very smart, but he's a fool in God's eyes. But uh, God reveals himself. So there's several ways he reveals himself. So the big way, not the most important way, but the big way in terms of size and so on, scope, is in general revelation that's accessible to all humanity. God's communication of himself to all persons at all times in all places as one writer said. Everybody knows about God, or they can know about God, and tells us in, in Romans that they didn't choose to know about God, and God, Father, didn't bother telling them anything else. So in nature, God revealed certain truths about himself through his created order, his glory, his power, his superiority. But this natural Revelation, this general revelation, has no way of saving anybody. No one ever got saved through natural revelation. They are made without excuse, God says, so they are without excuse. But they won't get saved that way. Nobody could ever get saved by going out and say, how, you know, I think that I shall never see a palm as lovely as a tree, a tree that lifts its, uh, lifts its arm, a tree that looks at God all day and lifts its leafy arms to pray. 
And then the thought writer says, ends up by saying, poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. And you know, a tree is an amazing thing. It's a very amazing thing. And we can't make a tree. We can put some things together that might look like a tree, but they'd probably fall apart in the first wind. But trees stand out there in the storm, don't they? God can make a tree. So uh, we can see that there is a God, but it won't save us. Let's look at Romans 1, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 20. So the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. In other words, nature. God made this stuff. Even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. <coughs> but the verse 21 says, because when they knew God, in other words, they knew there was a God, they didn't glorify him not as God, neither were thankful, but became in vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Have you ever read a story of someone in some remote place that found out about God by looking at nature and later on God came and gave them his special revelation? If you've read very many missionary books, you found about somebody that went somewhere and here's this tribe and they've been waiting for years for somebody to come and tell them the truth. They didn't know what the truth was, but they knew there had to be. They knew there had to be a God and they'd been waiting for this, and uh, so on. That's what, that's what Romans uh, 120 is saying. People can know there's a God, but that won't save them. Psalm 19, verses 1 to 5. Psalm 19, verses 1 to 5. The heavens declare the glory of God. Some of you can quote this. And the firmament showeth his handiwork, Day unto day utter a speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language, or their voice is not heard. In other words, what's God saying here? Nobody can say they never heard tell of me because I'm visible everywhere. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world, and them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. So God says people can know about me. They won't get saved by knowing about me from nature, but they can know about me and they can have a, a desire to know more. Or they can reject it and say, well, I'm going to make my own God by going chopping down a tree and having my own God. So that's general revelation in nature. And then in humanity, God created humanity in his own image. So when you look at people, as frail as we are and as sinful as we are and as sometimes as wicked as we are and as failures as we are, or whatever, we are made in the image of God. And uh, we speak about some truths concerning God. What is God? Somebody says, what is God like? Well, in some ways, God is like us. Now, I'm not trying to be blasphemous, but in some ways, God is like us because we're made in his image. So people can say, what's God like? Well, in some, in some way, he must be like you and me because we're made like him, so he must be somewhat like us. But, I mean, we're not God. I'm not trying to say we're God or even close, but he's made us in his image. So people can get some idea of what God is like, hopefully a big idea if you're saved, a better idea than if you weren't saved. But there's some way that we're revealed. Genesis 1.27 God started off and he made Adam and Eve... And says, God created man, how? In his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And then he told them to be fruitful and multiply and so on. And then in Romans chapter 2, we were just in Romans, but in Romans chapter 2, what does he say? See, we're, we're studying Bible themes, but we're not just... Uh, having a whole bunch of words about the Bible, we're using the Bible to demonstrate the Bible themes because that's what we're studying. So we says, uh, what happens here in Romans chapter 2, verses 11 through 16, for there is no respect of persons with God. God doesn't care whether you're rich or poor or big or small or, or smart or not so smart or, rich or anything else. 
God doesn't respect. God just says, I made you and you need to acknowledge me. For as many have sinned without the law shall also perish without law, and as many have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles which have not the law, and of course he's talking about not law, the law of New Brunswick, he's talking about the law of the Old Testament, the, the Jewish law. He says, but the Gentiles, they don't have the law. They do by nature the things contained in the law. These having not the law are law unto themselves. Not a law unto themselves in the sense that I'm the law, but they see things and from that, they know that there is a God and there's some rules that they have to have. Does every society have some rules? Is there any societies that don't have rules? Some of them might be not very good rules, but every society has some rules. I wonder why. Because we're made, we are not people that can live without some kind of rules. Uh, we just don't do very good. Uh, sometimes you have a household where there's no rules in the household. and. Uh, how do the kids fare? Are the kid, do the kids respect their parents if there's no rules? No. They may love their parents, but they, may not, but they probably don't respect them if there's no rules. Now, we can have rules that are so stringent that parent, the kids hate their parents, too. Or, I mean, there's boundaries there. But he says, uh, <clears throat> which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Is there something within man that knows that there are certain things that are wrong? Uh, if you get into apologetics and so on, people want, people want to argue, but what, is there a God and so on? And then they say, well, who are you to say what's right or what's wrong? Well, the point, by the very asking the question, they're acknowledging that there is right and there is wrong. Who, who says what's right and who says what's wrong? Well, society says it in a sense, but where do we get that sense? Well, ultimately, we get it from the Word of God. But even in societies that don't acknowledge the Word of God, uh, even societies that... Uh, may maraud uh, their enemies and kill them and eat them. They don't kill their own buddies normally because that would be wrong. They may kill their enemies, they may even eat them. But they know it's wrong not to look after their own and, and things like that. I mean, there's something in our hearts, even in the most depraved places. There are, there are rules. That's what God's saying here. There are some rules. Where do they come from? They come from God. It's built within us. We have to have that. We don't live very well without some kind of rules. And then there's history, general revelation in history. None of this saves anybody. But God says, I revealed myself in all these different ways so that you're without excuse. So in history, God is at work in history, and man's free to observe his work. We may not understand what God is doing. We may even, not even, we may even question what God is doing. But... We can learn what, what his movement from times past. Let's go to some, we've got a whole bunch of passages here and we need to look them up. Genesis, Exodus, chapter 9, verse 16. Uh, pastor was reading about, or talking about uh, Fanny Crosby the other day and saying that she had memorized Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, I believe it was. I think, I think maybe the whole Pentateuch, but Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. And somebody was saying, can you imagine memorizing Leviticus? You're not a Jew. You don't, have to, you don't live under the Jewish law, and you're going to memorize. You know, on the, on the eighth day thou shalt kill three lambs and two, two uh, turtle doves and so on, and you'll sacrifice them this way, and you'll offer this blood, and you'll do this and so on. I mean, that's, it's very important. It's all God's inspired word. But can you imagine memorizing that? And being able to quote it, William might. Not even William? No. But uh, Exodus 9.16, what does it say? God was working. What was happening in Exodus? Well, God was working through Moses and Aaron to free the children of Israel. And he was working with Pharaoh, and he worked with Pharaoh... And he says in, in verse 16 of chapter 9, In very deed for this course have I raised thee up 
for to show in thee my power that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. So what did God say about Pharaoh? He said, I made Pharaoh, I put Pharaoh in that position that I might get some glory to my name to show that I was God. Was Pharaoh responsible for his actions? Yes, he was. But God put him there. It started off by saying Pharaoh hardened his heart, Pharaoh hardened his heart, Pharaoh hardened his heart, and then it says later what happened. Then God hardened his heart. So, uh, God was working there. Jeremiah 51.1. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up Babylon. Ooh, now he's not only just raising up a king, he's raising up a whole nation, and against them that dwell in the midst of them that rise up against me a destroying wind. So he's going to raise up a nation, and what did he, why did he raise up Babylon? What was his purpose? What, what was he going to do with Babylon? Who was, act, who was acting up at the time? Judah, the kingdom of Judah, they were supposed to be godly people. They were supposed to be worshiping God, but who were they worshiping? Everybody else except God. They were going away from God. And God says, I raised up Babylon, and I'm going to take Babylon down here, and I'm going to destroy Judah, take them into captivity, and all these things. Well, how did Babylon get to be Babylon? Because God allowed them. God made them into Babylon. How did Nebuchadnezzar get to be Nebuchadnezzar? God even called Nebuchadnezzar his servant. And later on, after he had done all the things with Judah, he said, oh, by the way, I'm going to let you go over to, I believe it was Moab and Eden and so on, and, and capture them because they've been very wicked, and I'm going to let you spoil them because I didn't pay you for doing, my du doing your duty and looking after my, after my people in Judah. Wow. Did Nebuchadnezzar really understand that? Probably not but God was still working there. Proverbs 21.1. I think we need to keep these things in mind as we look on the world scene today, and I don't think we need to say that God is causing men to be wicked, because God never causes men to be wicked, but he does raise up men to do look after certain things, and sometimes they do wicked things in, in accomplishing his will. There were some places in the scripture where God brought in nations, and afterwards he punished that nation because they were too cruel. Remember Assyria? Assyria was very cruel. God used Assyria, but afterwards he said, I'm going to wipe you guys out because you did what I wanted you to do, but you were way too cruel doing it. So he looks after things. He, he's in control. Proverbs 21.1, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. Does God know about Vladimir Putin? Does he know about President Xi? Does he know about President Biden? Does he know about Prime Minister Trudeau? Does he know, does he know all these people? Did he put, who put them there? He did. Do you suppose he had a reason for it? Does God ever do anything without a reason? No. And we need to remember that sometimes when we get all steamed up about something or other, remember that God's in control, right? We're not. He is. That doesn't mean we don't have some responsibility to deal with things. It doesn't mean we don't have responsibility to be righteous. It doesn't mean we don't have responsibility to do this and that. But God is in control. Maybe sometimes he allows certain things to happen because... We haven't done what we should have done in the past. Maybe North America's in such a situation because the churches have messed up. Maybe we haven't got the gospel out like we should. I'm, I'm, I'm saying maybe in the sense that we, have, we haven't. Maybe our countries are in the mess they're in because we haven't been the salt of the earth. A brother Forbes that used to sit back there in the back, he had a favorite saying. He says, we don't get the kind of government we deserve. We get always get better. Every country has always had better government than what they deserve. Now, I don't know that I could prove that statement. That was one of Forbes, Brother Forbes' statements. We always get a better government than what we deserve. 
that may tell us quite a little bit about ourselves sometimes, right? <laughs> but the king's heart's in the hands of the Lord. Luke chapter 1. And by the way, just, just to put things in context, uh, we have some dear friends sitting here that could probably tell you about some bad government, couldn't you? Uh, we haven't seen bad government here compared to what some other people have seen, right? We could be on our way, but we haven't seen anything compared to what some other people have seen. Luke 1. 50 to 52. His mercy is upon them that fear him from generation. He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. That's interesting, isn't it? Put down the mighty from their seats. Uh, could Vladimir, I, I, I'm not suggesting this is going to happen. I'm not even wishing it on anybody, but could it be possible that Vladimir Putin we would get news tomorrow that he dropped dead of a heart attack. Could that be possible? I have no reason to believe that's going to happen, and if it does, it's not because I put a curse on him. So don't, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm just saying he putteth down the mighty from their seats. Have we seen that happen in history? Uh, have somebody, you know, taken it upon themselves to give them a heart attack, so to speak? Uh, it, it happens. God's in control. So, uh, Esther, let's, what happened in the book of Esther? Remember Esther? What did Mordecai say to Esther? He said, you need to, 414, we, we won't go there, but we know the story. Remember Haman, he was going to get rid of all the Jews, and Mordecai said, you need to go to the king. And she went and talked to the king, and what did she say before she went? She said, oh, if he, he doesn't invite me in, he can, he can have my head chopped off or whatever. And Mordecai said, who knows whether you've been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. And she said, I'll go before the king, and if I perish, I perish. Uh, did God put Esther there for a purpose? Did God put Mordecai there for a purpose? Sure he did. Remember who Haman was? He was the last of the Agagites. Remember what Saul was supposed to have done many, 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 many years before? God told him to slay King Agite get Agag and all his people and he let him go. Some people think that actually what happened there was that Saul, he did Samuel hacked Agag in pieces remember? But some people believe, uh, some historians believe that Agag had a wife who was pregnant at the time and she was let go. So therefore his descendants came from that. I don't know. I've, I've read that in more than one place. But uh, Saul didn't do his job. Because Saul didn't do his job, there was a big problem many, 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 many years later. Can that be a lesson for us? Do we have a job to do in life? As parents, as Christians, as church members, as citizens or whatever, do we have some things God wants us to do? And do we always do them? And if we don't do them, what happens? There are consequences. If God wants you to do something and you don't do it, there are consequences. I tell my grandchildren all the time, and they don't like hearing this, it doesn't matter who we are or what we are, when you do something wrong, there are consequences to it. And sometimes they're big. And people say, oh, God's, God's a loving God, and he wouldn't do that. Uh, well, you know, I used to tell my, my kids, I said, if you... Uh, I use this as an extreme example. I says, when you grow up and you, you get drunk and you go out and have a car accident and you lose an arm, and then you get right with the Lord, he doesn't make your arm grow back on. You're going to go through life without an arm. There's consequences for that sin. Whether you're saved or whether you're lost, whether you're saved or whether you're lost, or whether you're lost or whether you're saved. When we sin, there's consequences. And sometimes they're really big, and sometimes they come generations later because of somebody's sin way back here. So, uh, Genesis 50, verse 20. 
really interesting verse here of God being in control. Genesis 50, verse 20. Some of, I'm sure some of you can tell me what this is. You know what story we're talking about in Genesis chapter 50? It's the last chapter of Genesis. Remember, children of Israel have gone down to Egypt uh, uh, with, with Joseph. Well, Joseph had been sent down into Egypt, and he became the second in command and so on, and then the brothers went down, and they all went down and so on, and then Jacob went down, and Jacob died, and the brothers said, uh-oh, we're in trouble now because we sold Joseph, and he got to be down here, and he's the head honcho down here, and we're going to be in trouble. Would you have felt that way too if you'd been mean to your brother? And uh, finally, he got to be king, basically king. He wasn't king, but he was the head honcho. He was in charge of everything. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, you appeared before him, and you knew what you had done, and he knew what you had done, and your father's died. He's sort of your defense, and he's died. Uh, do you think you might go to Joseph, whoever Joseph is in your life, and you might say, uh, <clears throat> I think we have a little problem here. That's what they did. So in uh, Genesis 50, verse 20, it says, uh, they, they said, uh, in verse uh, 18, his brother also went and fell down before his face and said, Behold, we be thy servants, or your, we'll be your slaves. They were afraid he's going to have them all done away with. So we'll, we'll be your slaves. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, ye meant, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass as it, as it is this day to save much people. Now therefore fear ye not. Who was in charge of all this? God was. God was in charge of all this. Were they responsible for what they did? Yes. Did they, did they have many years of wondering if their father was going to find out? They were scared stiff their father was going to find out, weren't they? I don't think he ever did. But they were, they were scared about it, weren't they? Uh, did it do them? Did it uh, really help them? And they didn't like Joseph, and they got rid of him. And then they had to live in fear the rest of their life until they got down to Egypt. And now they're scared they're going to get their heads chopped off. And then Romans 8:28. What does that say? For we know that all things work together. Not all things are, but all things work together for good to those who love Him, to them, to those who are called according to His purpose. Right. Does it mean everything that in life happens to you is good? When you get sick, is that a good thing? But can God use your sickness to make you a better Christian? If you lose a job, is that a nice thing or a good thing? No, but could God be trying to tell you something? God, God be trying to grow you? And, and we could go down the, down the road here. This is general revelation. God reveals himself in general ways. None of this. So we have nature. We have humanity, we have history. God's revealing himself, that he is in control, but that doesn't save anybody. Nobody ever gets saved by general revelation. So we have to have special revelation. We won't get through this all today, but we have to have special revelation. Special revelation was when God is manifesting himself in specific ways that are not generally accessible. God's revealing himself specifically to us. His particular communications and manifestations of himself to particular persons at particular times, communications and manifestations that are available now only by consultation of certain sacred writings, namely this book. How do we find out about God in this book? We know about him from nature, but if we want detailed things about God, all we see from nature is that God must be pretty amazing. He must be pretty powerful. Uh, and when you look at some of, some of, you know, we look around at some of us, we realize that God must have a sense of humor because look at some of us. Uh, you know. Uh, and God certainly uh, is a God of beauty. Look at the nature that he made. I mean, just look out today. The snow, we may or may not like the snow, but look at the sun on the snow. 
If you really want a really beautiful thing, go in the library, the room at the end, and look out through those three windows onto the trees and the snow out there. You've got a, you've got a perfect Christmas card there. You've got three panels. You know how they make Christmas cards in panels? You go in there and look. I've taken several pictures of that, and I've always intended to make a Christmas card of it. It's beautiful. It'll be beautiful out there right now. God did that. We couldn't do that. Can you imagine how much work it would take to go cover that field with snow? I mean, just think about it. If you wanted to go out and make that picture and cover that field with snow, how many truckloads of snow would it make to put two or three inches of snow on that and get it all nice and smooth and shiny? We'd have it all messed up and be all muddy by the time we get done, wouldn't we? But God did that. He, he didn't even have to raise a sweat. We'd have a whole crew here working for days doing that probably. God does that. So he reveals himself, but that doesn't save us. Okay, so he reveals himself to specific people at specific times in specific ways, and he reveal and this has all got written down by certain people that he chose to put it in this book, and he tells us about himself. That's special revelation. And it has to be special revelation that tells us enough about God and about his ways that we can get saved. And uh, I'm just going to list these off, and we'll deal with them next week. But there's uh, different ways that God revealed himself in both the Old and the New Testament. Visions, dreams, angelic visits, direct speech, the Urim and the Thummim, theophanies, and the lot. So we'll, we'll look at all of these next week, different ways God revealed himself to us. But he has revealed himself in this book, and he says that all men are sinners, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We can't find that out in a tree. We may get the idea that we're not so good, or we may think we're really good, but we're not going to be told directly that all men have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We find that in this book. And he also tells us the wages of sin is death. Now we know we all die, but we don't necessarily know what happens afterwards. But we find out in here. But he says the gift of God is eternal life. We don't find that out in a tree. There's nothing out in any tree anywhere that says anything about eternal life. Those trees are all going to die at some point. And he says the gift of God is eternal life. If whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Thou shalt believe in thine heart the Lord Jesus. Uh, believe oh, My brain's gone dead. Anyway, we need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Call upon him. Ask him for salvation, believe of his work on the cross, and so on. And uh, we find that in here. And if we don't do that, what does it tell us in John chapter 3? If we don't believe, we are, what are we already? We are condemned already. We don't have to do anything to be condemned. We are condemned already because we're sinners. For as by Adam sin entered the world and death passed death by sin so death passed upon all men for that how many have sinned all have sinned so we're all sinners we don't find that in nature we don't find that in history we don't find that by looking at one another we find that in this book and we better believe it because it's God's word so we'll continue with this next week we'll be on this topic of the Bible for two or three weeks Father, we thank thee for the word of God. We thank thee that it's so precious. It's, so, it's such an amazing book. The more we read it, the more we study it, the more content that we uh, absorb, the more we know that we really don't know much about it. We don't know much about you because you're such an infinite God. We thank thee that you've revealed yourself to us in all these ways, and specifically in the word of God, and then we'll talk about later about the uh, other direct way you've revealed to us in the Son of God. We thank thee that you've provided salvation for us. We pray that each one of us here would be sure of that and that we'd be going on, going on our way throughout this day rejoicing in the salvation you've provided for us. We pray for the morning service that you will bless there. In Jesus' name, amen.